Well, good afternoon, Tahira Ismail. Welcome to the Best Life Wellbeing podcast. Um, what I'm doing here is interviewing people I believe are living their best life of well-being, and you will, you certainly fall into that category. Uh, we met um, through the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, and I have watched since then your career and your business blossom, um, the work that you've been doing to help people, and I'm so impressed by what I'm seeing. So not only are you the owner of Wellness Reclaim, you are a culinary nutrition expert, mm -hmm. um, a registered health coach, you specialize in gut health, and you're a certified consistency coach. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm, I'm honored. <laughs> and so one of the reasons I invited you at this time is because Ramadan is coming up. Mm -hmm. And um, you created a Ramadan or a gut-friendly Ramadan guide. Mm -hmm. And I want to hear all about this Ramadan guide and would like you to educate the audience a bit on Ramadan. It starts Monday, April 12th, and it's a month long um, until May 12th, correct? Uh, almost. So um, the Islamic calendar follows the lunar calendar. Mm -hmm. So every year it changes about 10, about 11 days. So it comes up 11 days. And to find out when the next day, when the, the first day of the month begins, we actually look for the moon. So when the moon is sighted, that means the month is beginning, right? So uh, it might be Monday or it might be Tuesday, depending on the sighting of the moon. Okay. And does it always start, I guess so, on a new moon? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and if it doesn't, if you don't, if it's not sighted when it's supposed, when you think it is, it's usually one or two days. If it's not sighted that day, then it's automatically going to be the next day. Okay. Tell me all about Wellness Reclaim. How did you come up with this name for your business? And what, what does that mean for folks? Sure. Um, so back when we were studying together at uh, the Institute of, for Integrative Nutrition, um, you know, they encouraged us to find a business name and, you know, I was, nothing was coming to my mind. I was, and then one day I was listening to a lecture and, you know, one of the, the speakers said something about reclaiming the, their wellness. And my husband just, he was sitting nearby and he goes, wellness reclaimed. And <laughs> it, it just, and I, I was like, yeah, I like it. that moment. I knew that that's it. And he was like, no, no, think about it. I was like, no, no, that's it. And, <laughs> He's like, no, no, think about it. I was like, okay, I'll think about it. But I knew that was it because, you know, so many, so many of us, you know, we, we go through so many struggles with our health and, you know, I want us to be able to reclaim our wellness, you know, to, to, to take it back where, you know, so much of our health is in our hands and, um, you know, we can totally reclaim it, uh, you know, to such a high degree. And it, it just spoke to me. So it, it just spoke to me and it stayed with me and it's still, you know, I still feel it in my heart, you know, this is what, six years, six, seven years later, right? Yeah. So that's where it came from. And, and that's so true. So much we can reclaim of our health and we don't feel empowered. We don't even feel as if we're working in partnership with physicians when, you mm -hmm. know, I'm going through a little something right now with some back pain and the physicians are clueless about what's going on with the back pain, but they are sure that if they gave me a little pain medication, it would take mm -hmm. care of it. And it, and you, you really do have to stand up for yourself yeah. and make them dig deeper. And so mm -hmm. no medication will not help me discover the root cause of this pain. Exactly. And, and so you definitely, I love wellness reclaimed and I love the thought process behind it. I love that it came from your husband and <laughs> you know, you two work together to make that happen. Yeah. Speaking of wellness reclaim, I read on your website that you had your own um, gut issues. And, and so first of all, healthy, the healthy gut is your expertise. That's your area of focus. So can you tell me a bit about your gut journey or your enlightenment to gut health and also explain to people what 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 does gut healthy really mean sure um so growing up you know you know i just lived my life and thought everything was normal whatever i was feeling no big deal right that's just you know how things are and 
So it was very common for me to eat something and run to the bathroom, right? That that's that's how I grew up, you know. And it it didn't occur to me for even one second that oh, this is not normal. <laughs> that you know I shouldn't you know have to go to the bathroom so close to after eating, right? And you know, and this continued for for many years. And um, you know, it was it wasn't until I was pregnant with my third child where you know I started having other health issues as well. Where or meaning one might not consider a health issue, just kind of like a random, you know, I was having acne, you know, my face was covered in acne, uh, acne like I've never had, you know, even as a teenager, I had my, this eye was covered in styes, like I had like five or six styes on my eye and, you know, had uh, other issues going on. And, you know, I thought, okay, it's the pregnancy. Once the baby's born, you know, these symptoms will, they'll go away. Baby was born. They didn't go away. And I was like, okay, you know, it's still hormonal. Maybe when, uh, you know, I, I weaned my daughter, then it'll go away. I weaned my daughter, didn't go away. So, you know, I was like, there, there must be something going on. So, you know, I wasn't even thinking of my gut at that time. It was just, you know, I was thinking more of, look at my face. You know, I look, I, I you know, I don't look very pleasant at this time. So I thought, you know, I don't use any chemicals, you know, so I don't think it's anything environmental. Maybe it's... Um, something I'm eating, right? I always knew, you know, you, we should eat organic and things like that, but I didn't really think about it that deeply. And then um, I was like, you know what, I'm going to just try sugar. Maybe it's sugar that's, that's, you know, giving me acne. So I, you know, just like that, I said, okay, I'm going to, I'm not going to have sugar anymore. And, you know, within a half hour, I just started telling people, and that was more to just kind of keep me accountable for it. You know, if I tell people I'm not eating sugar, then, you know, I'm, I better not be eating sugar. So I, I, start, I said, I'm not eating sugar. I'm not having, you know, the little chocolates and this and that. You know, Kit Kat was my favorite. I was always eating Kit Kat. Like, I'm not having any Kit Kat. So I stopped eating sugar. And within three weeks, about 75% of my acne was gone. So then, you know, from that point, I was like, oh. I'm onto something here, right? And that's that's what, you know, sparked my interest in improving my health. And, you know, slowly by slowly, I, I started taking certain ingredients out of my diet. And, you know, one day I realized, wait a second, I'm not having those stomach aches anymore. I'm not running to the bathroom anymore. And, you know, I realized by removing certain ingredients from my diet, I had I was healing my gut, right? So, and, you know, all that lightheadedness and all the other little, you know, inflammation I had throughout my body, I started noticing that, oh, my face isn't, you know, pink and puffy anymore, or, you know, all these little things started disappearing. And eventually, I learned that, you know, uh, you know, our, our gut is basically the base of everything, you know, whatever we're putting in our mouth, it affects everywhere else in our body. Yeah, so I, I started linking everything together and realizing that, you know, if our gut is not healthy, then everything else is going to be out of whack, uh, or at least most of the things are linked to our gut health. Yeah. And even when I started working with clients early on, even when I wasn't specializing in gut health, I actually was because I would always focus on cleaning up their gut first. And then eventually, you know, I, I, I realized that, you know, this is very important. You know, the, our gut health um, can make or break us, right? And if we want all the other, you know, uh, systems in our body to, to be functioning properly, we need to fix it. Yeah. So that's why, you know, I, I decided to focus on that and try and help people fix that. And then hopefully everything else will fall into place. That is amazing. And, you know, what's also amazing is, you know, you hesitated when saying your acne was a health issue, but it really was a health issue. Your body was communicating with you letting mm -hmm. you know that something was wrong, not mm -hmm. just through the acne, but you know, the other things you mentioned as well. And our bodies are so amazing in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, um, and so I, I understand why you would focus on gut health first with your client. It helps me also to understand your, um, your gut friendly Ramadan guide. Mm -hmm. um, because in your Ramadan guide, these are principles to live by. It's not just for Ramadan. Mm -hmm. So tell me what a consistency coach does. So um, 
I think one problem that a lot of coaches have is they know how to coach people. They know, you know, they know how to guide them and tell them, you know, do this, do that. But sometimes they end up losing a client because the client, um, you know, they're not so, they're not as consistent as they should be. They, you know, they, they kind of, they end up ghosting, right? They just disappear and, and the coach is just sitting there like, what did I do wrong? Right. And so this happened to me once in the past where, you know, a client just kind of disappeared. And I was like, I was like, you know, you know, what, what went wrong? She was doing well, but then, you know, she just kind of, she just disappeared. She just wasn't fully committed. Um, and so I came across uh, consistency coaching and, and like, it was actually like, just like right after that, I had that client ghost me. I came across, across consistency coaching, just like that. I wasn't even looking for it. It just kind of was meant to be. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, you know, it basically teaches how, you know, so many times everyone is basically going on autopilot, right? Yeah. We're not thinking of what, you know, why do we have these habits? Where are they coming from? You know, what are our triggers? What are our cues? And with consistency coaching, I help them to figure these things out, you know, to actually, you know, get out of autopilot and start thinking about, you know, you know, why am I doing this? Or, you know, what will motivate me to continue on this path, on, on the path to, you know, better my health. So with consistency coaching, I've learned so many different tools to help my clients to stay on the path. And, you know, and also to realize that, you know, sometimes we will mess up yeah. and we shouldn't beat ourselves up for it. Right. We just need to get back on and keep trying. Right. So, yeah. So that's, uh, you know, I'm with the consistency coaching. I'm helping the clients to break the old habits, the old bad habits and to bring in new habits and get out of autopilot. OK, so. <clears throat> I want to know what's different about what you do as a consistency coach. So can you tell me a bit about maybe a technique you might use to help a person stay on track, to help a person find their why and mm -hmm. connect to it? And that's, that's one of the things is finding the why, right? So a lot of people, like I said, they're just an autopilot. They're just moving day to day, not really thinking. They're not really thinking, they're just doing, right? And so one of the things that we do discuss is what is your why, right? What is, you know, what is going to help you to, to keep going? And we, we discuss it. We discuss, are you, you know, is it, you know, you, you want to be there for your kids. You want to have more energy for your kids. Or is it, you know, you have other, you know, perhaps business goals or work goals that you want to accomplish that you can't do when you're feeling like this, when you're, when you have poor health, right? So we, we look into that or, or it's even, you know, sometimes people have relatives, you know, maybe their parents who had poor health and they don't want to end up in the same situation they were, right? So we, we discuss that. We also, um, you know, discuss their vision. You know, we, 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 we stop and think, where do you want to be? You know, what, what do you want your life to look at, look like? And, you know, I provide them with worksheets and things like that to, you know, go into detail, to imagine it, to see it, you know, that, you know, you know, I, I'm living this life, you know, my house is like this, or, you know, I'm helping these people, you know, whatever, you know, we get down to the, you know, very finite details, because the more they imagine it, the more they can bring, make it into reality, the more their brain will start thinking that they're already there, and make it easier for those pathways to actually be made. Right? So there, there's those, and then it's also just sitting down and, you know, discussing, you know, why are you having cookies every night? What, you know, what's leading to that point? And once we're there, what can we, you know, instead of having the cookies, you know, once you realize, okay, this is what I'm doing, you know, what can I do instead of sitting down and having the cookies? What can I replace it with, right? And we take it step by step because, you know, if you tell someone do this, 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 and this, they're gonna just laugh at you and, and you know, and it's right. over, right? Right. So, you know, it's basically step by step. It's I'm not telling them to have, you know, you know, yeah, I want them to have their vision, but at the same time, we take it step by step. Right? I we don't want I don't want them to be overwhelmed and just, you know, drop everything. We really, you know, because in the beginning we take it step by step. You're you're not exercising at all. So, you know what? We're going to exercise 3 days a week for 5 minutes. 5 minutes only. Right? And 
Just take it step by step, step by step. Small steps, you didn't do it this week, okay, we're gonna do it next week. And then they start adding on and adding on and adding on. And as the weeks go by, you know, they actually start building it up, building it up, and then their vision starts to look more attainable to them, right? So we just start with baby steps and 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 work that way, and and then by the end, it's it's like astonishing how much they've actually uh, accomplished, and with with no judgment. I tell them, it's, you know, no judgment here, and so I feel that makes them more open to you know be honest, right? Because someone might say, yeah, yeah, I did this or I did that, but you know, if I'm going at them with no judgment, they're going to be honest with me yeah. and then they'll actually start making progress. Tell us a bit about Ramadan. Why do you celebrate it? What it is? And um, sure. it's just, yes. And can okay. anyone celebrate Ramadan? Do you have to be Muslim to celebrate Ramadan? No, um, you don't. I mean, obviously it's, 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 it's obligatory for all Muslims who are capable to, to fast all 30 days. Right? So it's a commandment that's been given to us by God to fast all 30 days. And it's not only, um, you know, fasting from food and water. And, you know, a lot of people always ask, oh, water too? And it's like, yes, water as well. So no water or food from sunrise or from dawn to sunset. Okay. And... Um, I didn't know it was water too. <laughs> yes. Yep. So, so no fluids during that time. You can only have fluids during basically the, the night hours. And um, not only are we, you know, abstaining from food and water, but, you know, you're working extra hard on, you know, not saying anything wrong, you know, being rude or, you know, trying to increase our good deeds. So we're doing more charity. We're, we're encouraged to do charity and good deeds throughout the year. But in Ramadan, it's, you know, we're, we're told step up your game, do more, right? In, okay. in this month, we're told that, you know, our good deeds are multiplied. So if you do even more, you know, they'll be multiplied even more. So, you know, we're told to, you know, take care of our neighbors, you know, don't go to bed if your neighbor, without knowing that your neighbors are uh, fed, right? If you, you know, you know people are hungry, then help them out, right? So we're, we're supposed to take care of other people, help other people out. Um, and let's see. So yeah, so we fast from dawn to sunset. And yeah, anyone can fast if they'd like to, you know, it's, you know, a good sisterhood, brotherhood of, you know, if other people join us and learn about it as well and experience it. And, you know, I think it's a common misconception that people think that we fast so we can get a feeling of what, you know, those who are less fortunate than us feel. But, um, you know, that's not the case. But um, I mean, because, you know, we're fasting and at the end of the day, we know we're going to eat, right? Someone who's less unfortunate, they don't know when they're going to eat or they're not going to know if they're going to get enough. So it can never be comparable. So we can't say that, you know, oh, we're doing this for that reason. No, we're doing it because it's a command of God and, you know, to practice uh, self-control and in, increase our good deeds. So I read that there are five pillars. Five pillars of Islam. So this is like the, the basis of the religion, right? Okay. Everything else is built on top of this. So the first one is the Shahada, which is the testimony of faith. So where we say that, there's no deity worthy of worship except God. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his last and final messenger. So to be a Muslim, this is the basic thing you, you need to have is, is this belief, okay. right? Once you've, you've uttered this belief and you believe it, then you're a Muslim. Uh, the next one is to pray, right? Um, as Muslims, we pray five times a day, and this is an oblig obligatory um, commandment on us. So we, you know, we pray at uh, between dawn and sun sunrise, and then once um, around noon, um, it all goes based on the sun, and I can't remember exactly where the sun is at that point. And then um, the next prayer is when the sun is like the highest in the sky, and then the next one is at sunset, and then once it's totally dark. So we have five prayers that we have to do every day. The next thing we have to do is um, called zakat, which is um, almsgiving. So, you know, everyone who is capable 
is required to give 2.5 percent of their um, of their um, worth in charity every year. Right. Um, the next is fasting. So again, whoever is capable. Uh, of course, people who are um, you know, say they have diabetes or, you know, health, uh, um, health issues that prevent them from fasting, they're exempt from it. They would just have to feed, um, you know, for every day they've missed in fasting, they would have to feed someone else, like someone less fortunate than them, and uh, to replace it. So fasting and then Hajj, which is the pilgrimage to Mecca. So everyone who can afford to, every Muslim who can afford to, is required to go to uh, Mecca to perform Hajj once in their lifetime. So what is Hajj? Hajj is so when is, is the pilgrimage to Mecca, and there, what you need to do is, you know, there's certain uh, steps that we take, and it's basically we are following in the footsteps of the Prophet Abraham, or we call him Ibrahim, and also his wife Hajar. Hagar. We're following in their footsteps uh, during the, this period. So, you know, we have to circum circumbobulate the, the Kaaba and we go around it seven times. And then we also run back and forth between two hills, which are called Safa and Marwa. And um, we do that because that's what Hajar did uh, when um, she was looking, she was searching for water. She was in the area by herself with her son, Ismail. And they were running back and she was running back and forth searching for water. And so we are copying her footsteps when we are performing the Hajj. And then there's other little little uh, acts of worship that we, we do during that time. Have you experienced um, the pilgrimage to Mecca? I have. I went back in 2008. So it was, uh, it's kind of, you can't describe it. Once you get there and you see the Kaaba, you know, it's like it's like clarity, you know. Everything just seems so clear, and you know, and you're so focused. It, it's it's a it's a very undescribable feeling when you get there and you experience it. It was it was amazing. It was almost it was 12 years ago, and I can still remember it as if it was yesterday. I would love to experience it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let's talk now about this um, gut-friendly Ramadan guide. And why did you feel this was necessary? So um, a number of years ago, uh, I came across these news articles that were from overseas that were saying that people were being hospitalized for overeating, like excessively overeating in Ramadan. And I thought that was a huge embarrassment. I'm like, you know, that's pretty much the opposite of what, you know, we're supposed to be doing in Ramadan. We're supposed to be practicing self-control, taking care of the the needy, not being excessive ourselves, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, that was the first reason why I decided to do that, just to kind of remind people that, you know, you know, why are we fast fasting? And then, and you know, you're doing your rituals throughout the day, but we have to also think about, you know, are we being excessive when we're eating and um you know, there's nothing wrong with having good food and things like that. But then when you overdo it or you start eating foods that aren't good for you, then we're kind of negating the purpose. Mm -hmm. So I, I decided to do it then. And um, and also because I feel like, you know, this this would be a way, to, you know, I can get this in people's hands and it'll, you know, not only maybe change their habits during Ramadan, but maybe it'll help them change, you know, throughout the rest of the year. Because like you said, it's not just a guide for, uh, you know, just for Ramadan, but it is pretty much a guide for for eating all the time, right? Yeah. And I've even had someone who, who said that to me where, you know, I hadn't seen her in a long time and I was looking at her, I'm like, she looks different. I, you know, I can't point my, you know, I don't know what it is, but she looks different. And then she was like, she was like, you know, I lost all this weight and I, you know, I was pre-diabetic and I'm not anymore. And and it's all because of that guide that you made. And I was like, really? She's like, yeah, I just started using it all the time instead of just in Ramadan. And I was like, oh, okay. And so, so you know, it's not just for Ramadan, it's for, for always. And I thought, okay, I can get this in people's hands and, you know, hopefully they can benefit from it. How gratifying is that when someone tells you that their life has changed because yes. of your work? Like that is yes. so amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was so happy when, when she said that. I was like, wow, you know, that, that made me feel good. 
usually thinking of what to eat takes more time than the actual cooking, right? So I tell them, you know, come prepared. You don't want to spend the whole, like we're, we're encouraged in Ramadan to do, you know, read the Quran more and do good deeds and, you know, do all sorts of things and not be spending all our time just on cooking, right? So, you know, I encourage people to, you know, make a, make a plan, write down all your meals, you know, know what you're going to be cooking, do your grocery shopping based on what you're planning on cooking so there won't be wasting of food, things like that. Right? Basically making a plan beforehand so you're not stressed out on the day or you end up ordering out because you can think of what to eat or you waste food, things like that. Um, then I get into, you know, foods that we should avoid. And again, this is foods to avoid throughout the year, but um, in Ramadan, you know, our window to eat is so short, especially in, in the, you know, in the summer, especially when it was the, the longest days of the year. You know, we had, I think, maybe maybe four or five hours window to eat. And so when you have such a short window to eat, you want to make sure you're eating the best things possible so you can be functional throughout the day, right? So I encourage people to avoid eating sugar because, you know, as we know, it puts our hormones on a roller coaster ride. Same thing with our blood sugar and, you know, leaves us with all sorts of um, symptoms that we we shouldn't be experiencing in Ramadan if we want to have a productive day, productive month, right? And then also fried foods. Fried foods is, a, is I would say, a big problem in a lot of the Muslim communities uh, in, in, our, in different cultures because, you know, a lot of people, you know, will link the, the samosas um, I'm not sure if you, yeah, samosas and like the spring roll type of things, you know, all these deep fried foods, which taste, they taste really good. I, I, you know, I admit that, you know, I'll have one here and there, but they have such a bad impact on our gut health, as well as, you know, say heart health and just causes all sorts of inflammation throughout the body, right? And also, you know, bloating and you know, diarrhea and all these type of things, right? And you know, after we eat in the evening, you know, we're encouraged to pray, you know, for a good portion of the night. And if you've just eaten a meal that, you know, makes you feel sick, it makes it so much harder to just be standing there and praying. And, and I'm sure you've seen how we pray. We have, you know, different uh, motions. We're standing up, we're bending down and things like that. And getting into these positions when you're, you know, extremely bloated is not very comfortable. Yeah. Right. Uh, refined flours, I encourage people to stay away from just be, for the same reason as sugars, right? It turns into sugar in our body and has the same sort of effect. Mm -hmm. And I also encourage people to stay away from gluten, so which is another big thing. Um, I think that, you know, I think everyone all over the world is, you know, big on wheat, right? It's the, it's the flour that's the most produced, right? So, um, you know, I, I personally experienced so much benefit when I stopped eating, you know, especially in Ramadan, it was, that, it was probably that same year, you know, when I was changing my health, I stopped uh, in one Ramadan, I said, okay, I'm not going to have like the rotis or the paratas, you know, in, in Ramadan. And, you know, I woke up and I was, I was like, wait a second, I didn't have an upset stomach after eating and I didn't have to run to the bathroom. And, you know, and again, all those times it was all normal to me that, you know, I just thought that's just the way it makes me feel, deal with it, right? Yeah. But when that happened, I was like, no, this wasn't normal. <laughs> you know, I need to remove this from my diet and I'll feel better. So, and I know so many other people would benefit from removing gluten from their diet. And gluten also not just affects the gut, right? It also can um, cause um, nutrient deficiencies, things like that. So you might not feel something necessarily, but it could be still having a negative effect on your um, body. Yeah. Right. Um, I also discouraged people from taking conventional cow's milk because once pasteurized milk, milk has been pasteurized, it's devoid of nutrients and has a negative effect on the body as well. Yeah. So I, you know, encourage people to stay away from that, you know, so many people get the gas bloating and, you know, diarrhea from it as well, right? So I said, avoid that. You'll most likely feel better. Processed foods, of course, um, you know, which may taste good, look good, but, you know, it's usually filled with chemicals, 
right. that aren't benefiting us. So I told people to avoid that and also uh, caffeine, you know, and I, because caffeine is usually a diuretic. So yeah. drinking one cup of, cup of coffee, you got to replace it with another two cups of water. So, you know, on the long days of Ramadan, you don't want to be feeling dehydrated. You don't want to be constipated, things like that. So, but I did say that, you know, some people have a really good relationship with caffeine and they want to continue it. I just encourage them to make sure you're making up the water that you're losing. And then I also explained to them that if you can't, um, you know, give something up, then at least try and reduce it or get a better version of it, right? If you're going to have bread, you know, get a higher quality bread, you know, not one that's filled with sugars and, you know, fillers and all that type of stuff to make it nice and fluffy, get get better quality um, so it won't have such a poor impact on your body. Right. Then we moved on to the what sh we should be eating, so uh, eating and drinking. And of course, number one, I put down as water, you know, we're 70% water, right? Yep. So uh, if you're not having the water, then, you know, everything else is going to be out of whack. So, you know, and you don't want to be dehydrated, you don't want to be constipated. So increasing water and after that high fiber foods right we want them to you know digest slowly in our body so we have so we're not you know we don't eat and we're suddenly hungry again we want it to be sustained go through us slowly and keep us full longer right proteins you know obviously we need a lot we need protein as well for our body to function so you know we got the proteins there and then the fat. About 60% of our brain is fat. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure we're getting good, healthy fats in there. Not obviously not the vegetable oils and all that type of stuff. We want, you know, the, the, the nuts and the, um, you know, coconut oils and, you know, different healthy fats. And we want to have a combination of, you know, our proteins and our fiber and our uh, fats to give us sustained energy throughout the day. Right. That, that's the best way to be able to last a full day, not just focusing on one of these groups, but having a combination of all three to get us through the day. Yep. And I encourage people to have some fermented foods because, uh, you know, when we look at our gut health, we want to have good bacteria in there. We want to have pro probiotics. And by eating fermented foods like kimchi, sauerkraut, um, you know, fermented pickles, these type of things, it'll give us the. Uh, good bacteria in there to help us digest better and have better bowel movements and just overall good gut health. And, um, you know, I also touched on how, you know, it's the the sunnah or the, the sayings and the doings of our prophet that he said um, that no human ever filled a vessel worse than his stomach. And, you know, basically we're supposed, he told us to eat, you know, if we're going to fit, you know, we shouldn't fill more than one third of our stomach for food, one third for fluid, and leave one third for just, you know, for our breath, for our air, right? He yeah. encouraged us to, you know, to not overeat because that's one of the worst things you can do for your body. And when we overeat, obviously it leads to weight gain and, uh, and again, the whole bloating and all that type of stuff. So it's, you know, beneficial for in Ramadan, but also obviously beneficial for the rest of our time. And, you know, I touched on how chewing is beneficial. So many times we just, you know, gobble the food down yeah. and essentially you're basically flushing that, those nutrients down the toilet when you do that, right? We have to slow down, eat slowly, let our brain catch up uh, with our stomach and, you know, let the digestive juices flow so we can actually get nutrition out of the food that we're eating, right? So this essentially is, you know, the Ramadan food guide. And I put in the, you know, a checklist in there so people can, you know, keep track of, you know, what they've actually accomplished. And it just, so it can be there for them to see it and then just be there as a reminder. And also, you know, I put the recipes in there. So it'll give them some sort of inspiration as to, you know, what different ideas can I have? What can I eat during, uh, you know, Sahur and Iftar? And I saw the checklist. Okay. I thought this was a really great touch to add to the guide. And I was really inspired to see the gluten-free roti recipe. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. It was that, um, you know, that I was very proud of that, I must admit. And, 
you know, I had given that recipe to my dad and, you know, he gave it to my stepmom to make. They made it and they were like, it was like a real roti. And that was like, that was the ultimate like praise, you know, if you, if you get your parents to. Yes. So I was like, yes, I did it. You know, you talk a lot about bloating and, um, you know, diarrhea. And this is a bit off track, but can we talk a little bit about poop? <laughs> Sure. How sure. poop is supposed to look? Um, how often should we poop? Um, it, it's so important to be able to eliminate. Um, mm -hmm. You know, drinking water, yes, very, very important. Eating foods that are hydrating foods, extremely mm -hmm. important. You know, and I tell people all the time when you fill your plate, fill it with mostly hydrating foods so that you're not just getting your water from drinking water you're getting mm -hmm. water from eating hydrating foods mm -hmm. but poop is so important and you know I remember um going to the doctor some years ago because I I'm, I was constipated hmm. I believed I was constipated and so this gastroenterologist he's like no you're you're not constipated it's different for everyone you know, if you poop every three days, that's the way your body is designed. Design. I'm like, no, that's constipated. Like by definition, that's constipation. Mm -hmm. um, basically, yeah, you want to be able to go approximately, you know, every 18 to 24 hours. Um, you know, and again, you know, your doctor is right that, yeah, everyone is different. Yes. But, you know, three days is a long time. Right. So if it goes, you know, a little bit above 24 hours or a little bit below 18 hours and you're not, you know, it's not diarrhea and it's not, um, you know, so difficult to come out, then that would probably be their normal. Um, and, there, you know, there's a Bristol stool chart. So it, it has, you know, in the middle is where we want to aim to be, where we got the nice, smooth, snake like, you know, poops. And at one extreme, you know, you have the hard little pellets, you know, like the little bunny pellets. And then on the other extreme, you have like very liquidy, watery poop. So we want to try and aim to be in the middle. And if we're somewhere, you know, on, at closer to the extremes, then we have to examine what is going on with us. And, you know, someone could be like, well, I'm eating really well. You know, I'm, you know, eating fiber foods, I'm drinking a lot, and I don't know why this is happening. And if that happens, we have to also look at what are other factors that are, you know, happening in their life? Are they extremely stressed out, right? Do they get nervous very easily, right? So there's a huge, you know, gut brain connection. Yeah. So if you start feeling a certain way, it can affect your, your gut health, right? So sometimes it doesn't matter how well you're eating. If you have stress or other factors affecting you, or you're not sleeping well, or, you know, you have a lot of toxins in your body, that can also affect your gut health. Right? So there's so many different factors that we have to look at to see, you know, why is my poop this way? Yeah. Right. You know, I actually wrote this quote, um, the one you mentioned, I think this is pray to become, oh, this isn't the one you mentioned, pray to become closer to God, freeing, I could, don't understand my handwriting, soul from harm, impurities, purification for soul, heart, mind, and body. Where did I get that from? I wrote it, like I wrote it, but I, did I pull it from your guide? I don't know. I don't think I have that. But I mean, like as as Muslims, um, you know, in our guidelines as to what to eat and what not to eat, you know, we're told that we have to eat pure foods, right? So we can't eat, you know, foods that are filled with toxins and foods that, um, or like, you know, same thing with like animals, animals that are not raised in a, um, you know, uh, um, in a manner that they're happy in, right? The whole factory farm system is not a pure, you know, it's not a pure um, method, right? So we're, we're encouraged to eat pure food. So uh, I'm not sure where you got that from, but uh, works for us. I like it, yes. So I asked how your dad is doing and your dad is a medical doctor. He is a medical doctor. He's 82 years old. He's still practicing full-time. Um, and the reason that is, is because one of, the fields he works in is geriatrics. And, um, you know, years ago, he would see his patients, you know, they would retire, 
and then suddenly their quality of life would decline. Yeah. You know, and he saw this over and over and over again. And he was like, I don't want to go through that. Yeah. Right. So he said, OK, I'm going to work as long as I can. So he really influenced me and, you know, also taught me that like age is just a number. Right. Because and, and he's never, ever once called himself old. I've never heard him call himself old and even true that you know once you start you know thinking of yourself in a certain way then it you really fulfill it right if you think of yourself as old then you will become old yeah and you know I've heard so many people who are in their 40s and they're like oh you know I'm old now and I'm like no you're not if you're if you're old now what are you going to be like in your 60s 70s and 80s right, right? right. so it, it's, it's totally you know it's, it's all about the mind right if you you have the right mindset then you can accomplish so much and then you're, you're not you're not limited to anything. Right? It is, it's so important to think of yourself in a holistic way, because as you're talking about the mind and the way you think about yourself, I go right back to the gut because the gut impacts the way your mind functions. You do begin to feel old when you're eating the fried foods and you're eating a mm -hmm. lot of sugar and, and your body is telling you you're old. And so your mind is also telling you because it aligns with the energy. Like if you don't have the energy, Mm -hmm. Yes, your mind, your body feels old and your mind is telling you you're old. And, and in many cases, it's because of what you're eating. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yes. I'm, I'm just good, grateful to hear your dad's story because also when you're, you're helping people, he works with aging people and his mindset, you know, when you're helping people, it helps you to stay young as well, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so um, even you mentioned this lady who read your guide and she's like, I started using it all the time. And you couldn't, you looked at her, you couldn't figure out what was different about her and how much her, her appearance, not just her energy mm -hmm. and everything else, but you yeah. just looked at her external appearance and maybe the way she was responding in a more energetic way and saw she's brand new. She's yeah. reclaimed her wellness, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you could see that. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think, I, so one of the things I'm doing now is I've just became a certified death doula. Oh, okay. And like your father, um, I have been around so many people in my profession who have retired and they stay home and take care of their grandchildren and they get old because they don't have a life of their own, a right. vision for a life of their own. They don't believe that they should have a life of their own. And so they mm -hmm. sit home and they help their children by taking care of their grandchildren and they don't have hobbies. They're not learning anything mm -hmm. new. They're not doing anything new. Mm -hmm. And they just decline and, and, and get old. Mm -hmm. And I want to help people to really one, think about the fact that right now while you're healthy, begin with the end in mind. One day you will die. Mm -hmm. And when you're on your deathbed, chances are there's not much you can change about the way you're living. Mm -hmm. And the right. way you're living right now will impact the way you perceive your death, right? There are lessons exactly. for us to learn throughout life. There are opportunities to grow. There are opportunities to embrace change. And when we stop embracing the change, it will impact us for the rest of our lifespan in a not so positive way. There are so many options now, you know, you don't have to just be embalmed and buried. I'm sure in um, your religion and your background, embalming is not an option. Am I right? Right. It's not an option. We just, um, uh, it's encouraged to basically the best way is wrapping the body in two white pieces of cloth. And, you know, depending on the laws, you know, usually in US and Canada, you have to have some sort of casket, right? But there's no embalming or anything like that. But if it wasn't, an, if we didn't have to, it would just be the body directly, you know, in the two white cloths directly into the ground within, within the day. I, I told my children, which they are totally against, that I, I want them to handle my body. I want them to be the person to to wrap me in those cloths and the people to to cleanse my body and to spend those last moments with me. Yeah. And they're like, mom, we're not doing it. <laughs> I, I, I did it. I did it for my mom. It was me and my sister and, you know, uh, a few other people. And, and, you know, we washed the body and, you know, all the little rituals we, and we ourselves 
uh, wrapped her up. And it was, you know, I felt like it needed to be done. And I felt, um, I felt a relief, you know, it was me doing it, it was me taking care of her. Right. And I, I felt happy that I was able to be right. the one to right. do it. You know, right. it gave me a, it gave me a closure. Right. My, my grandmother was a, 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 a midwife. And so mm -hmm. the reason she was, is not because this was her area of expertise. Right. And so, but that was the most sacred option, right? To be there for someone in your community to help them bring a life into the world. Right. And I'm sure when people died, they did exactly what you did with your mom. Right. And that is the most natural way to, for it to be done, in my opinion. And mm -hmm. I'm, I can't say that I want to encourage all people to, to manage death in that way or to spend those last moments with their loved one in that way or their loved one's body but to at least start to think about death differently and start to think about the way you live your life differently in relation to death thank you for for sharing um you know about what your dad is your young father is doing yeah. <laughs> and how he continues to influence your life you know when we've had conversations in the past you speak so very highly of him and how much you admire him and how much he has influenced you to do the work that you're doing and yeah. it's so great that you have him as a resource right oh yeah yeah i still um you know if i have a client that i'm having you know, I need some help with, I, I give him a call and I, you know, say, what do you, what do you think about this, this, and this, and this? And he, he helps me out. He's, he is a physician, but, um, uh, he, I would say he's a little bit different. He's been the biggest supporter for me and, um, you know, he's always been there for me. And so Tahira, thank you, um, so much. Um, this is our first time meeting face to face. It is. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity to, to meet with you face to face today. Um, again, I've known you for some years, but this is our first face to face mm -hmm. meeting. And so hopefully at some point in life, I can meet you in person. And mm -hmm. um, when this pandemic is over, even get a big hug. <laughs> yes, yes, that would be great. You know, I really, uh, I really appreciate you having me on here. And um, yeah, like you said, we've known each other for so many years. And then this is and this is our first face-to-face, -face and, I, and I really enjoyed it. Thank you. I enjoyed it as well. And I, I look forward to maybe an opportunity for a future conversation. I'm grateful that we're able to continue our relationship and, and to help lift one another and learn from one another. And I hope you don't think it's weird, but I love you. Oh, I love you too. The interview I just had was amazing. There are a couple things I didn't say, like assalamu alaikum to my sister. And I did not ask her to share how she can be found on social media and on the web. So she can be found at Wellness Reclaimed, Wellness Reclaimed on Instagram, Facebook, as well as wellnessreclaimed.com. And a, she specializes in gut health, which is so important to our overall well being. But Hira is certainly on her way to doing more amazing things in the lives of people who are in need of living their best life. So, thank you for joining today, and we'll see you next time.